Now, special content areas are important to take care of when you're writing the paper. Microarray data and other large data sets, RNA-seq, um, GWAS studies. You have to follow MAAME guidelines for how it's presented and how it's made public. You have to set up a geolink or a similar database that allows you to set up a link so reviewers and editors can access it, and then once it's accepted, it's publicly available. Um, but you know, you can't say when you submit a paper, get it accepted. Well, it's really important, and I'm still working on the next part of the study, so I, I don't want to make it public now. No, you, by submitting the work, you have agreed to make this public at the time of acceptance. And if you try to make us delay acceptance by not returning your page proofs or not responding to emails or phone calls or whatever, we'll just, you know, we won't publish the paper. So figure this out in advance by negotiating with your PI, by negotiating with your collaborators to make sure that they understand that you've submitted the paper and that this is going to be public and if they're going to do things that they are worried about um, confidentiality for, they need to do them soon or they need to tell you to delay your, your submission. Microscopy, you need to include the required information on data acquisition. And you have to follow what are called the concert guidelines, at least for phase three trials when you're presenting clinical results. They're very helpful. Their website can show you. They're the things you always see at the beginning of clinical trials, showing how many patients were screened, how many patients you know, signed consent, how many patients went through each series of steps in the protocol. And remember to specify your IRB or ethics committee approval and the date of entry of the first patient on the trial and the last time for follow-up. Your figures and tables should be self-explanatory. I've already said plan the figures based on the way they're going to look in the final publication. Think about planning them based on the likely size on the final journal page or on the final computer screen. So again, don't make too many small panels. And generate your figures and tables first, not last, because you're really your text should reflect how you're going to present the data in a logical way that's based on how you did the experiments. And if you have to keep looking back and forth between three different figures that are out of order when you explain them in the text, it can be very confusing. So image manipulation is not a new problem. Um, this is a, a, a picture that was taken of the leaders of the Re revolution in 1919 showing Trotsky in the middle. And then um, in 1937, he became not cool, and they just got rid of him in this picture. So, you know, it's not, it was harder to do back then. Now it's gotten very easy to do, but that doesn't mean that you should do it. Um, so why is it wrong to manipulate images? Well, an image can often carry information that goes beyond the specific point that you're trying to make. So bands or splotches that you try to erase with various, you know, Adobe tools or cut off may be more important than the real bands. And Peter Agri, who won the Nobel Prize, he's a hematologist who discovered aquaporin, which is a hydrogen channel uh, on cell membranes. He gave a, a great talk at, at ASH uh, four or five years ago, and he made it clear that he discovered aquaporin by mistake. It was a quote-unquote contaminant or degradation product on a Western blot, you know, that today he probably would have cut off or photoshopped out, and he never would have figured out how important it was because he was showing a seminar and showing this blot, and somebody else, who I don't think won the Nobel Prize, said, well, couldn't this be this? And anyway, they went around and chased it down, and, you know, he won the Nobel Prize. So, you know, don't get rid of stuff just because you don't think it's important, because even if it's not important to you or you don't understand it, it may be important to somebody else. And the quality of the image has implications about the care with which you've done the experiments, which I keep stressing. So, um, you know, but cleaning it up to make it look nice, making something look too nice is usually very suspicious. And, you know, a gel that has all these splices, and, and when we do our software for image manipulation detection, if you start look, finding things that looks like somebody has tried to manipulate the data or erase things, that's immediately going to get you um, your paper rejected and potentially reported to your institutional scientific uh, conduct body. So, you know, don't do it. So most journals now have very specific guidelines for what you can and can't do with images. I'm proud to say that Blood was, I think, the second major journal that, that put these guidelines into place. We actually copied them <laughs> from Journal of Cell Biology, but with attribution and permission. Um, so no specific features within an image can be enhanced, um, enhanced obscured, moved, removed, or introduced um, um, without attribution or showing that you've done it or explaining that you've done it. If you do group images from different parts of a gel or different images from microscopy, you need to show that you did that by putting dividing lines or by boxing the cells and by explaining in the figure legend what you did. If you adjust brightness or contrast or any, make any other adjustments, you need to apply it to the entire image. Now, it's reasonable to adjust contrast if something is just bleeding out the entire figure and you can't see stuff you want to show. On the other hand, it's not reasonable to turn it down so that contaminating band in your water control goes away. That's the kind of adjustment that would be considered uh, you know, not, not ethical. But on the other hand, that kind of thing is actually impossible to detect. 
um, making nonlinear adjustments to your images for microscopy, and you know, deliberately misrepresenting your data um, you know, will result in revocation of acceptance and reporting to your institutional um, and your funding bodies. So at Blood, we actually scan all gels and photomicrographs and accepted papers before they move into um, actual pre-publication and the official acceptance process. And the objectives are to educate authors, to ensure accuracy of the information, transparency, and integrity. Um, and so it's, I think there's a lack of training and guidelines for trainees and, and even PIs regarding this increasingly sophisticated you know, software that we all use now to generate our data. And the problem is, I think that you, know, you come into your PI's office and they don't know how, to, how you made this figure because it uses some incredibly complicated machine or software they don't understand. And they don't necessarily ask to see the primary data because they can't even understand it. Um, and, but they haven't sort of made it clear to their trainee that, you know, I don't care, I, I, I don't want only good news, I want you to show me the data in it, all of its warts so we can decide together how to present it. I don't only want to see perfect, beautiful data where you've erased all the blotches and the contaminating bands. Um, so I think it's important as you start your own labs that you do do mentorship in this aspect of how to do science and don't push people to only show you data that's good because if you ask them to show you only data that's good, eventually they're only going to generate data that's good in ways that may not be the best and you're going to get into trouble later on. Um, the detection process, we just use a standard uh, set of digital screening techniques that were actually originally um, developed by a guy at Dartmouth who was using it to look for art fraud and to you know, just det determine if somebody was, you know, you know, plagiarizing a Van Gogh or pretending something was a Renoir when it was, you know, painted down the street. Um, but we look at, we at large images, we look for changes in contrast, we look for changes in brightness, and we look for, you know, abnormally artificial um, barriers between one part of a picture and another. If the scan fails, we contact the author for an explanation. We usually ask to see the primary data, and then we it goes ahead to the editor for an evaluation, a decision on what to do with the paper. Most of the time, it's education. People just don't realize, even though we say it five different ways, that they can't splice bands out. And we say, OK, show us the original data. It looks OK. It was just they spliced a band out because there was an air bubble or something. And we say, OK, you can splice them back together. You can run the gel again. That'd be the best thing. But if you can't do that because you have no more sample, you know, you can splice out that lane, but show a line and say in the figure legend that you spliced something out there. And then it's fine. And this just shows a typical lane splicing example where this was pretty obvious because they didn't even line it up very well. But, you know, um, and, and this is what the scan showed. And, you know, it was patient samples. They couldn't get more of them. So we just had them put the lines in, and it was OK. And here's a photomicrograph. We could see here that they just thought it would be nice to have three instead of two cells. And they just dropped a cell down from somewhere else in the image. You know, again, it was all from the same experiment. It was all even from the same slide. They could show that to us, but that wasn't OK. So we just asked them here to separate them and show, you know, show a box if they wanted to show three cells. They couldn't just drop it down in the middle. <laughs> so how to avoid trouble? Well, keep the original file. I've said this once already, but it's important enough, and people get screwed up enough with this. Um, you know, you keep the raw file, keep the raw data. When you leave the lab, if you're a PI, make sure that you actually know where all the primary data is because people go off to Alaska or Timbuktu or Antarctica and you can't reach them and you have to find the original data and you can't find it. Then you start wondering whether the original data ever existed. Um, so don't erase that original data file. You know, when, when the lab tech says we're going to erase all the files on the sequencer because we're running out of disk space, well, make sure you go in there with a with a hard drive and, and copy it to your own drive and, and keep it. Um, you know, note the image dimensions and the resolution when you collect data, and I've already told you about keeping the adjustments the same over the entire image.